years now that we have seen on our borders a phenomenon that is undoubtedly concerning. We see thousands of people, men, women, children, desperate people escaping from regions in distress, cause distress caused by war, caused by terrorist acts, caused by hunger. And we see this on the frontiers of our country, in Italy, in Greece, on the coasts of Turkey, but we also see it in the Balkans and also between Mexico and the United States, between Indonesia and Australia. So we really are talking of a global mass migration phenomenon, and we cannot stay, be indifferent to this. I would like to ask you to look at this event, this dramatic event, as an opportunity that each one of us has as an opportunity to choose what kind of economy we want to set up for our world, for the future of our world. What kind of an economy do we want to plan? Because it's not just war refugees who come to our continent and to the other continents that take them in as well. These are people who are escaping from hunger and poverty, from fields that have become desert because of the drought, factories that have become prisons, who are escaping from regions that have been completely overtaken by war and have become war regions of war. So if we look at uh, the figures that the United Nations presents us with, if we look at just Africa, for example, we see that 80% of wars in Africa is caused by the conditions in which Africans are forced to live of extreme poverty, of hunger. And these conditions are due to environmental degradation, but also they are due to our inability to offer to that continent and to other needy continents the proper tools, the tools that they need, because we, and we've got to admit this, we have exploited those continents. We have not been capable to promote the development in those continents, and this is an economic model which cannot be allowed to continue. If we do not change, we will not uh, uh, bequeath a livable world to our children, to the future generations, because the world is global and that which happens in Africa or in Pakistan or in Indonesia or in Mexico, that which happens there affects us all. So I think that the link between these phenomena, which are also phenomena that uh, lie at the origin of terrorism, it's logical. Terrorism flourishes in places where there is greater poverty, where the conditions of life are more difficult. Now, I think that the link between refugees, migrants, terrorism, and our economy, the type of economy we have in our world, is a link that is so self-evident that we cannot pretend we don't see it. So, I think we should try and understand if, as some economists would have it, if it's true that since our economy generates wealth, is always a positive economy. I don't agree with that. I think there are tragic examples of negative economy. I'll give you two examples today. One is an example that comes from a city, Rana Plaza is a city of textile industries in April 2013 it suffered the worst tragic accident a whole building 
where the industries were located collapsed. Over a thousand people were killed, 2,500 were badly wounded, and I don't think we can be unmoved or indifferent when we learn of these phenomena. If people are paid less than two dollars a day and they live in conditions of extreme poverty, of abject poverty, simply in order for us to be able to buy our clothes at a lower price, well, this is not fair. We are, we must choose what to buy, where to buy it. We must pay greater attention to the fact that our choices have an impact also on people who appear to be so distant from us, but they suffer from the consequences of our choices. Now look at this film, it's a very short film, but look at it. It's called The True Cost, and it talks of this phenomenon, which is called fast fashion. Please project this video, thank you. Cutting corners and disregarding safety measures had become an accepted part of doing business in this new model until an early morning in April when an event just outside of Dhaka, Bangladesh brought a hidden side of fashion to front page news. Well, state media in Bangladesh say an eight-story building has collapsed near the capital of Dhaka, killing more than 70 people. Garment workers in Bangladesh paying the price for cheap clothing. A huge crowd has gathered near the building site, many of them family members looking for loved ones, and they say they can still hear people screaming from underneath the rubble, crying out for help. Many are simply losing hope. The building was structurally unsafe, and yet they'd been forced back in. Many survivors are asking how they could have been forced to return to work when management already was aware of the cracks in the building and workers' concerns on the very day of the collapse. A lot of clothes in American stores are made in Bangladesh by workers who earn about $2 a day. Last month there, a garment factory collapsed, killing more than 1,000. And a few months before that, a factory fire killed more than 100. As story after story of clothing factory disasters kept filling the news, it was now the case that three of the four worst tragedies in the history of fashion had all happened in the last year. This is an example. It's a very long documentary you should go and look at it. It's called The True Cost. It's a very moving documentary because apart from this tragic example, it also causes, it also talks about uh, the destruction of a healthy environment that causes disease and poverty. I'm going to bring you more examples. I know that these examples are very uh, uh, upsetting, but unless we look at reality the way it is, we will not know how to change it properly. The second example comes from India. It is a type of production that has changed uh, in India over the years, and uh, they have gone from the production of cotton to genetically modified cotton. And this genetically modified cotton, as a monoculture, has impoverished the peasants. and prevents them from developing and maintaining the biodiversity of their fields. And in just a few years, the monoculture of the GM cotton, promoted by a huge US multinational, this monoculture has made it increasingly difficult uh, for farmers to survive by their agricultural work. And in a particular region in India, there have been recently, in the recent years, 200,000 suicides. Because in the past, where farmers were able to buy their seeds for nine rupees, they had to all of a sudden pay 400 times as much. And since the cultivation of cotton was their only 
source of livelihood, they were no longer able to support their families, and 200,000 of them decided to kill themselves. So please show us this last uh, video, if you can project it. Thank you. Once again, this shows us a dramatic situation that a country is going through right now. Monsanto is proud to be the industry leader in agricultural innovation because of what these agricultural advancements can do to help you double yields for the future needs of the world. We're dedicated to the future of agriculture and providing farmers with innovations that help them produce more and conserve more while improving the lives of people around the world. Together, we can face the challenges of the next generation and beyond. BT cotton is a cotton in which a gene has been added from a bacteria to produce a toxin. But the BT cotton, which is supposed to control a pest, has been offered because it's a way for companies to own the seed. So farmers get into debt when they get the seed because of the high cost, 17,000% more. They get into deeper debt because it doesn't deliver on the promise of controlling pests so they have to buy more pesticides. The tragedy with chemicals, whether it's fertilizers or pesticides, is that they are what has been called ecological narcotics. The more you use them, the more you need to use them. For a while, the yield of the single commodity climbs and then it starts to decline because you have contaminated the soil. It's the day those agents of these companies come to the farmer and say, you owe me this much, you haven't paid back, now your land is my land. That day, the farmer will go into his field, drink a bottle of pesticide, and end his life. And every widow I've talked to said, and the neighbors came and said, they first found my husband lying in the field. In the last 16 years, there have been more than 250,000 recorded farmer suicides in India. That's about one farmer every 30 minutes. These are negative examples. Fortunately, however, in the world, we have many positive examples. I just want to mention one, because I spoke about textiles and I spoke about India. Here in this hall, we have Anna Zegna. She is an example of positive economy. She's an example of positive economy, both because of how she produces and also the way how she helps and promotes uh, the poorer communities in India, actually. So these are the examples we should be studying and we should be looking to in our transformation of our social economy. How do we do this? How do we go about this? I think we need to act at two different levels. Firstly, at the private level, each one of us can choose what to buy, what to consume, how to consume things consumption goods, you can choose traceable products. Each one of us can choose. Let's not leave the responsibility up to others, up to institutions or governments. Each one of us shoulder our own responsibilities. Let's show by choosing our products what world we want to live in. And the second level is the level to encourage our institutions to pressure them into helping us along this path towards change. Uh, Ambassador Al Nasser told us about all the important meetings that have been held this year. I want to mention two in particular. First, the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals agenda signed by all the UN member states, which has traced a roadmap with all the 17 new SDGs based on sustainable development, but also social inclusion and the protection of the environment. 17 goals that go from creating decent work for all, creating peaceful societies, in making our cities inclusive, building a world 
that can be changed into something more positive. So let's follow this roadmap. There are going to be national plans that will be implemented. Let's hope that these national plans, including the Italian national plan, will actually set itself steps and stages, each verifiable, so that we get towards 2030 with intermediate stages in which we monitor our progress. Now, one last point our cities. I know that the mayor, Nyasi, and I would like to thank him for his support. He's always been very supportive of our forum. He has already told us that Rimini will be one of the city that uh, will be taking into consideration the positive economy indices. In 2050, there will be over 6 billion people living in cities in the world. So unless we solve the problems of social inclusion, of development, of the environment within our cities, uh, we will not solve the problems of the world. But if we do, we will be solving 60% of the problems of the world. So my call is to the mayors of our cities, and I'm from Milan, so I hope Milan will be one of these cities. I hope that our cities accept this challenge and accept to have their indices monitored and measured. Uh, positive finance, education, citizen participation, the use of resources, these are all indices that are then transformed into indicators, measuring the levels of investment of cities, measuring the employment of young people, measuring the social welfare of the elderly people, uh, to create resilient cities, sustainable cities from an environmental point of view as well. I think this is a huge but great challenge, exciting challenge. And alongside the project for the positive tourism next year, I hope that we will also be able to have Italian cities and other cities as well that uh, will be part of this forum. And I think that really this is a duty for us for the future. It's something we really have to do. We owe it to the men, women, and children who die, unfortunately, in the Mediterranean Sea crossing on those boats. We owe it to the women, men, and children who died uh, in Rana Plaza, to the farmers in India, to all those who are suffering. We owe it to all of them, to all human beings who are willing to work hard to transform our model into a model of positive economy so that we can create a better world for ourselves and for our children and for everybody. Thank you.